How y'all doing? Good, 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 good. I'll be honest with y'all, I ain't no teacher. Uh, but uh, I hope that y'all bear with me and, and we'll, we'll get through this together, all right? Um, so actually, I struggle with this. Brandon called me a couple weeks ago. And he was like, pick one of these, uh, the, the deacons, uh, the deacons are teaching Bible study. Pick one of these, uh, which one are you going to do? And uh, I said, the purpose of prayer sounds like a good one. It sounds like a good one. But, you know, it took me, and that was about two weeks ago, and I, I really, like, struggled to get into it, um, to really t- trying to study and prepare for this um, because I was overthinking it, uh, plain and simple. Um, but I finally kind of got on my, ha- my own head, um, you know, talk to talk to Jalen's dad. He's a he's a pastor in Springfield, Illinois, um, and really, you know, just allowing the spirit um, to sort of guide me. So that's where this came from. But I thought it made the most sense to not start with the purpose of prayer, but to start with what is prayer. Um, and so I want to I want to ask you all what you all feel like prayer is to you. Anybody, Christian. Conversation with God. Meditation. Meditation. Recite uh, what you were saying when you prayed, but then, like, the more you grow up, you realize you got to be genuine. You don't have to follow a list of what to say to Him. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. Audible. That's a good one. Um, so I'll give you all this quote by Dr. Miles Monroe, a person who's, um, who's teaching I kind of use to prepare for this a lot. Um, he says, prayer is not just an activity. Uh, it's not just a ritual or an obligation, nor is it begging God to do what we want him to do. It is communion and communication with God that touches his heart. Um, so scriptural basis for that, um, I went to John 15, 4 through 8. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Verse 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 8 says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Um, And then there's some additional context that we'll get into in a second. But um, we keep seeing that word abide. We keep seeing that word abide all throughout this this, this excerpt of, of, of Scripture. And abiding means connectedness. Um. It's that communication and that communion that Dr. Miles Monroe talked about in his quote. Um, and then we also see the, the word fruit come up a lot. And if you were a part of our last Bible study series, you understand that, that we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that, that we see in Galatians. Um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, but it's us connecting to the source. It's us connecting to the true vine um, that we can be spiritually fruitful. And the more intimately that we're connected with God, um, the more productive that will be and more effective that will be in our prayer life. Um, but I want to I turn, turn our attention to um, Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Anybody have a Bible app pulled up and can, and can look at that for me and read it? Psalm 37, verses 4 through 5. And I think there's a mic going around somewhere. Psalms 37, 4 through 5, you said, right? Yep. This is the King James Version. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desire of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth the righteous as the light, and judgment as the the noonday, seven and last. 
Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who persecuted in, in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so verse 7 of John 15 has to be viewed with, with that scripture in mind. So delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, we know that our desires have to be in harmony with those of God, righteous desires. Um, so as far as, as, as long as our wills are in line with the will of God, our request will be granted. Um, moving on to 1 John 3, 18 through 22, if anybody has that. And also, go ahead, if anybody feels led to go ahead and get to Matthew 6 and 33. First uh, John 3, 21 and 22. Nope, that's it. That's it. That was good. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to put that into a little bit of context. So the verses leading up to 21 and 22 sort of emphasize the need for us to not only act in love, but also act on love. Um, and it sort of mentions the feelings of conviction that we get when we don't do that. Um, now, I want to I say this, that God's love is unconditional. No question about it. But God's approval is not unconditional. Um, we definitely have to, we definitely can be confident in his love, but it's hard to get that feeling of approval without fellowship. Um, we must, here's the word, abide in him before we can have confidence in the aspect of our relationship with him. Um, he will only approve those things that are according to his will. Um, and, and I know we don't like the word, that's what everybody always says, but to put it even in simpler terms, abiding in him is obedience to him. Um, if somebody wants to pull up Matthew 6 and 33 for me, go ahead. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thank you. Very familiar scripture. Um, and it simply means that if you devote yourself to a godly lifestyle, um, God will provide whatever we need. Um, in order to see his kingdom come. Simple as that. So what is prayer? Prayer is a privilege. Um, through the work of the Son on the cross, we've been extended an invitation to get to know the Father. Take it a step further, prayer is one of the ways in which we cooperate with God, a uh, means by which we can call upon God and the pros process by which we are moved by his spirit. And then even breaking that down a little bit more, uh, prayer is expressing to God what is in your heart, communing with God as you grasp his will. You try to understand what he's, what he's wanting you to do, communicating with God through his words, um, through scripture, feeling especially close to God, sensing he is there before you and believing that you've got something to say back. So now that we understand a little bit more about what prayer is, we can talk a little bit about the purpose of prayer. I like this quote by Dr. Tony Evans, and I used it to sort of formulate um, the points that I came up with. So, it is the goal of prayer for God's kingdom to be manifested on earth, for his power to be realized in and through our lives, and for him to be glorified because he got involved with, the, with us when we communicated with him. So, the purpose of prayer, the main purpose of prayer, is to continually seek to glorify God. We can go back and look at um, John 15, 7 through 8. Of, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 8 says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Uh, many of us think that prayer is for us. And I think that when we, when, we, when we believe that and we go into thinking about that, we sort of miss the point of it. Um, we pray for ourselves, but oftentimes we forget to take into account the whole will of God um, and, and what he has planned for his own kingdom. Scriptural context, Psalm 29 and 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor 
of holiness. So in, in this particular, te- in this particular uh, scripture, David is instructing the angels um, to exalt the Lord. Um, but we as believers should also have this same sentiment that we need to glorify God in everything that we do or even choose not to do. Go ahead. I will. I will. I will. <laughs> um, I'll repeat what I said. Um, the sentiments are the same. Um, we as believers should attempt to glorify God in everything that we do and even some of the things that we choose not to do. Um, 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, it's not on the screen, but it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, um, do it all to the glory of God. Um, Hebrews 13 and 15 says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Um, So that means even if we're praying, we're praising. Psalm 34 and 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Um, and I would also encourage you all to, in, in your own time, to, to go read Psalm 34, the message version. It's very good. It's, 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 it'll preach to you if, you if you really let it minister to you. Um, but it starts with, I bless the Lord every chance that I get. My lungs expand with his praise. Um, when we pray, our lungs are expanding. And so that's where we have an opportunity to give him, to give him the fruit of our lips, to give him a praise, uh, to worship him. Um, but another purpose of prayer um, is to align our mission with his mission. When we pray, we should never attempt to bend the will of God to our own fleshly desires, but rather we should acknowledge God as sovereign and use our prayer time to bend us to fit the will of God. Um, so throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus provide a great example of how we ought to pray. Um, Matthew 6, and, uh, six 9, and 10 um, this is when um, this is when Jesus is giving his sermon on the mount, and he's talking about the Lord's prayer, the model prayer, or the disciples' prayer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and also, he kind of repeats a very similar uh, model in in Luke 11. That's why you see that right there. But he says, "Pray then like this: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven." So notice how he starts with glory. He starts with glorifying his name. Um, To be hollow means to be regarded as holy. Um, And I'd even venture to posit that that Father is a form of glorifying God as well. Um, Calling him Father, calling him Creator. Um, When you you look into the Greek, I went went deep with it. (laughs) When you look at the word pater that he uses um, throughout throughout the the New Testament, um, it means creator, it means upholder, it means ruler. It can even be broken down to the intimate lover of my soul because we share the same spirit. Um, and so, so when you, I feel like when you, when you call him father, that's, that's your way of, of showing glory. Um, but then as we move on and as you see him say, not my will, but your will, um, your will be done as their own. I moved ahead. I got excited. Um, <laughs> um, we see submission to God's will. But Matthew 26 and 39 kind of follows the same thing. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Um, so, we, well, again, we see Jesus glorifying God to start out with um, and taking a very submissive and humble uh, position. Not only calling him Father, but he also gets down on his face um, and and and. You know, we take that, and sometimes it sometimes uh, it, it's sort of like an emergency response, but it's also a very submissive approach, um, and and glorifying the Father. But you see here that when he said, "My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me," it was a very overwhelming situation. Um, he makes a request because he knows that his suffering is coming, um, but he immediately. Cause, um, cause his own fleshly desire into submission with God's plan. And what's powerful, me, powerful to me is that the son's commitment to obeying God is so strong. Um, like, like us as humans, we, he felt a ton of emotion, but he never let that emotion he felt outweigh his faithfulness. Um, and I, I just really thought that that, that was powerful. Um, and then if you all even take a look at John 17, we don't have to read it right now, but 
Um, it's known as the high priestly prayer, and it's Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying for himself, he's praying for his disciples, and, it, and he's also praying for future believers. But it's all, it's, it's all a prayer to God about his will, about his plan coming to pass. Um, and so that leads me to the final purpose that I'll note. Um, the purpose of prayer is to cultivate our dependency on God. Oftentimes, we will pray for circumstances to change, uh, but we rarely pray for God to change us in the midst of our circumstance, neglecting the fact that he uses our trials to not only grow us but shape us, all in order to put his power and glory on display. I'll repeat what, I, I'll repeat what I've been saying. Prayer is not for us. We are just simply the beneficiary of its results. Prayer is not for us. We just reap the we just reap the benefits. Moving on to uh, the scriptural basis for this, Jeremiah twenty nine and eleven. All these are very very familiar scriptures, but I think I think they're important for us to to read. Um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Verse twelve says, Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me, and I will hear you. Um, so in full context. You know, this, this particular scripture doesn't necessarily apply to us um, just based on the time, but the sentiments remain. Um, we can rest securely in the, good, in the good plans God has for those who are in Christ. Um, but verse 12 and 13, and 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Um, that reminds us that as his plan continues on to unfold, we have to continue to pray and seek him and go after him all the more. Um, so that so that his plans can really be clear, carried out. Looking at Jeremiah 17, verses 5 and 7, um, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Um, verse 7 says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, um, whose trust is, is the Lord. So I don't have it here just for, for space, um, but verse 6 describes the cursed man in verse 5 that is destined to experience hardship, um, experience distress, um, and, and eventual death. But conversely, verse 8 goes on to explain how the blessed person who trusts the Lord can expect to grow, um, can expect to prosper, can expect to even thrive in the most difficult of, and challenging of situations. Um, Looking at Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it's my favorite verse, but I, you know, I had to throw it in there. Uh, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, the, the prayer part of that, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It's a little bit different than some of the other scriptures that we've, that we've seen where he says, and, and your request will be granted. Um, the, result, the result of that scripture is peace. Um, and, and notice how even after we pray, we might not, we might not immediately know the result of what's going to happen, but, but I feel like all of us can attest to the fact that after, after we pray, after we say our peace, we receive peace. Um, and that's a blessing. Um, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Um, I think Pastor brought this up, um, if not this past Sunday, a couple Sundays ago. But the, the context of this verse is, is um, Paul praying three times for the thorn to be removed from his side. And, you know, God didn't remove the thorn, but... He still prayed, and God, it was really an opportunity for God to say, you know, to flex, if you will. Um, really an opportunity for God to say, you know, your weakness is, is, where, I'm, is where I'm most powerful. You know, when, when, when you don't feel strong, have an understanding that that's, that's what I am. I am strength, um, and that's a blessing to me. But I wanted to also highlight this, this last verse, and, and, and then I'll, I'll get out of y'all's way. Um, Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right fan, excuse me, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, 
not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize the unquantifiable power that God gives us that we have access to through prayer. Um, and only we have access to it as believers, uh, which is a blessing. Um, as we pray, we, we begin to get a better understanding of who God is, um, which ultimately leads to a greater love and, and a stronger faith. Um, and, and that's a blessing.